So we've been on an Advent journey towards our true home, a place of hope and peace. And this week, we focus on the joy of home. Now, I know you've heard me say this before, but I'm going to say it again. The sermon that I give is the sermon that I have lived. And so this week was really stressful for lots of reasons. And so I found myself yearning, thirsty for joy, real joy. And of course, God provided what was needed. Do you need some real joy today? I can't wait to tell you my joy stories. But first, let's prepare our hearts with prayer. So Lord, I remember that joy song the most of us, many of us sang in Sunday school. I've got the joy, joy, joy down in my heart. Well, today we open our hearts to receive this joy that goes down deep, deep, deep in our hearts to stay. Thank you, God, for you are our salvation. Amen. So today we lit the candle that has sometimes been called the shepherd's candle. Um, it's the pink one. And it, why it's special, it's the, this is the Sunday of joy. And the shepherds responded with joy to the angel's proclamation when Christ was born. And so in the Latin, it was sometimes called uh, gaudete, which means rejoice. And the prophets, they looked forward to that day, not only that when Christ would come, but also when Christ would come again. And so it was, it was a time of great joy. And, and if you read the prophets, like prophet Isaiah, Isaiah would talk about a lot of gloom and doom. He was not happy with lots of things people were doing. But he always looked forward to that time when God would come. And he, you could almost hear him shout joyfully when the scripture we read today, surely God is my salvation. And in our other scripture in Philippians, the apostle Paul was in jail. He was having a really rough time and yet he tells us to rejoice. In fact, he says it, do it again. Say, I say again, rejoice. What did he have to be re joyful about? But you know what? He wasn't joyful or rejoicing about his circumstances. He was rejoicing about the God who was present in the middle of his circumstances. That was his joy. In our passage from Isaiah, there's an illustration that I just really like that helps us understand this kind of joy. Listen to these words. With joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. You see, Paul needed joy, but he knew where to find it. He went to the well of God's provision. Isaiah is focusing on who God is. He says he's our salvation, our strength, our defense. And he's telling people to go to the well, the source of all they need. The word salvation here is it means deliverance, help, restoration. We ought to go there often when we need strength or hope or sustaining grace and joy. Salvation's more than just that moment when we made a decision to follow Jesus as Lord and Savior. That's the starting point. But salvation in the sense that it's presented here is about God's constant work in our lives, God's constant present working and, and working in us and loving us and using us. So notice that the word is wells, plural. That's more than one well. That's good. God's wells of salvation are everywhere you go, okay? They are places and times when we experience God helping us, saving us, delivering us. We don't come to these wells to analyze the water or discuss the water or memorize the water. We come because we're thirsty and we need to drink. Think about being in a desert and you are hot and you need water to live. Is your faith like that? Is it just an intellectual exercise? Or is it a relationship that gives life to you? So we go to God and joyous, joyously draw water we need to live our life. And this reminds me of a time when Jesus met the Samaritan woman at the well, and he offers her living water. And up to that time, she was missing something in her life. She knew that she, she needed more of something, and Jesus offered her something she could not find in her life, and that was a relationship of living water, which represented the joy of, and the love of God. 
And she found that joy. She was so excited, she ran back and told her friends about what had happened. You see, sometimes we get confused a little bit. We think being happy is the same thing as joy, but they're a little different. Happiness is connected to what is happening around us. Happiness is a temporary emotional response or feeling to our circumstances. When things are good, we're happy, right? Okay, you know, we're happy, but things are bad, we're sad. So it, it doesn't last. Our culture tells us to pursue happiness through seeking pleasure, being healthy, having lots of friends, possessions, money, toys, power. The problem is if we do not have these things, we lose our happiness. I love that I listened in on the sermon for our, from our downtown Christian fellowship yesterday, and Scott Patterson was bringing the message, and he talked about happiness is an outside-in perspective. You're influenced by the things outside coming in, whereas joy is the inside outward perspective. You're, you're seeing things from a joy that's in you already. It comes not from the outside. Well, joy is also more than just an emotion. Joy comes like an unexpected gift when life is hard. In the desert of grief and fear and disappointment, we can still go to those wells of salvation and experience joy. My dear friend, uh, Reverend Deb Bond, um, I've known her for years. We both were called into the ministry at the same time. And so um, um, recently she lost her husband to cancer. And so she wrote a blog that came out this week, and I just have to share. It's on joy. I just want to share a little bit of what she wrote. She, she says, Joy resides in the place where hope and peace and sorrow and mourning reside, together in the human spirit. She goes on to write, Joy resides in the deepest, quietest, hardest, angriest, least loving part of you. You don't earn it, find it, reclaim it, or kindle it. Joy is just is. And in the fleeting moments when joy pops up, you remember, once again, it is a gift. She ends with these words, joy mingled with grief, that's where I'm living, resting in God's goodness and lighting a pink candle this week. There the divine rests in the midst of crushed tissues and sympathy cards, and joy is enough. The Christian writer Henry Nowen describes it this way, we are inclined to think that when we are sad, we cannot be glad. But in the life of a God-centered person, sorrow and joy can exist together. A joyful person does not necessarily make jokes or laugh or even smile. They are not people with an optimistic outlook on life who always relativize the seriousness of a moment or event. No, joyful persons see with open eyes the hard reality of human existence. And at the same time, they're not imprisoned by it. They have no illusion about the evil powers that roam around looking for someone to devour, but they also know that death has no final power. They suffer with those who suffer, yet they do not hold on to the suffering, and they point beyond to everlasting peace. This reminds me of 1 Peter 1, 1 6-9. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief of all kinds of trials. These have come so that they have proven the genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perish even though refined by fire, may result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. This is the part I like. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with inexpressible and glorious joy. For, the, for you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. This is the message of Isaiah to the people who are in exile. This is the message uh, from Paul when he's in jail about joy. It, this is the words from Peter now as he's sharing this with us now. All I could think about was a special song that uh, some friends of ours wrote from a long time ago, Paul and Mary Lou Day. And so the song used to be sung on different retreats we used to serve on. And I love this part of it. It goes, I'll just read the words. Even though you don't see him, you still love him. And even though you don't see him, you still believe in him. And he will fill you up with his glorious joy, his exalted and expressible joy. And you shall receive for your faith this gold, 
the salvation of your soul. This is what happens when you draw close to the well of God's salvation. Okay, so here's my joy story this week. I, Randy and I experienced that. Randy's my husband here, and it's a big deal. He's here today. I'm just going to say that. Say hi, Randy. Hi, Randy. Okay. Okay, so Randy and I, Thursday night, we had, had a lot of busy things happening this week. And so um, we were, I was going to pract- work on my sermon that night. He was going to go to band practice. We go out to eat. We're sitting in the restaurant chatting. Everything's fine. And all of a sudden, he gets a blank look on his face. And then he holds his chest. And I'm like, oh, my. And so then he says, stands up. He says, we got to go. And we haven't got our food yet. And I'm like, are you okay? No. My machine's going off. So Randy has a defibrillator um, from when he had a heart attack years ago. And so if his heart stops or gets out of rhythm, it shocks him. Well, this was about what was happening. And it was about to, it actually had happened um, earlier in the week, so I was already kind of nervous about this, but now now we were taking it very seriously. Um, I wanted to call an ambulance. Randy said, no, you're driving me. So I'm driving his big truck going, now I have anxiety and my heart's racing. Um, But we get there, okay? And we, we get there and there's joy. And so what's the joy? The joy is that we got there safely, You know, I could have been driving somewhere where I didn't know, I wasn't familiar, but we got there. Um, We got there, Randy was taken back immediately. Um, There was joy, and they had a special machine handy that works with his brand of defibrillator. And so they were able to go in and see immediately what was wrong. He did not have a heart attack. He does need to follow up with the doctor, right? (laughs) Yes, okay. And, but there was joy in that. So instead of having dinner like we had planned, I was having joy that we had a snack at Sheets on the way home (laughs) because, you know, um, in 2000, December 7th of 2000, he was being airlifted to Washington Adventist because he was having a major heart attack. I'm okay with a snack at Sheets. It's good. So there's joy in that, right? Even though it was scary, even though it was hard. We spent five hours in the ER, but there was joy because God was with us. God was providing what we need. It says in Nehemiah, the joy of the Lord is our strength. And I felt that that night. In this first chapter of Philippians, Paul gives us some advice on how to rejoice. Let me read it again. Rejoice in the Lord always. I I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. So let me stop there. Part of Finding that joy is being gentle. And so gentle, sometimes we don't really know what that means, but it has the idea of humility, compassion, meekness. So in the emergency department, Randy and I were there and could observe for five hours. Um, It was packed. There was no beds available. Um, Some of the doctors, nurses, and technicians had been working a whole day shift. They were tired. And there was all kinds of serious issues going on. I was almost in tears at the amazing compassion and, and love and care that those people that worked in that emergency department was giving. There was an elderly gentleman that was, he brought in on an ambulance, had no family. He was very um, confused. He kept trying to stand up. There was a nurse that just stayed with him, just like loving him, redirecting him, calming him down. I thought she has lots to do, but she took that time. She was gentle. She was kind. That helps us in the middle of hard times to find that joy. And then he says also, the Lord is near. Okay, so when God is always near to us, we need to draw near to God. And he says, do this through prayer and petition. Now the word petition we don't use often, but it means to make a formal request to an authority with respect to a particular cause. It means to ask for something. Actually, it means to get down on your knees and beg God in tears, please help me. You ever been there? That's petition. Okay, and so the, that's, what we, that's what it is. So someone that's looking for God's help, um, that, like I said, I love that the Hebrew word for wells can also be translated spring or fountain. So I kind of like this idea that you're desperate. You go to the well, I need your help, God, and then God's presence splashes all over you like a fountain. Okay, that's what I feel like sometimes when God shows up in those places. C.S. Lewis, a Christian author, uses this analogy. 
Good things as well as bad, you know, are caught by a kind of infection. If you want to get warm, you must stand near a fire. If you want to be wet, you must get into the water. If you want joy, power, peace, eternal life, you must get close or even into the thing that has them. They are not a sort of prize which God could, if he chose, just hand out to anyone. They are the great foundation of energy and beauty spurting up at the very center of reality. If you're close to it, the spray will get you wet. And if you're not, you're going to stay dry. Randy and I felt the nearness of God in the hospital. And that presence gave us joy. We felt like we were not alone. And then in the next part in that passage in Philippians, it says to give thanks. I found myself saying over and over again, I'm so glad that God helped me drive Randy's truck. <laughs> I am so grateful that they were able to see Randy. I'm so glad he didn't have a, a heart attack. Um, being grateful redirects your anxiety to God and to joy. I think that's, that's important. That peace then comes that guards our hearts, even when we don't know what's going to happen next. So when we have an encounter with God that splashes joy on you, what should we do? It says here, proclaim the good news. This is why I had to share the story. Now, back in the verse in Isaiah, it says, With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And you will say in that day, did you hear that? You will say in that day, when you get the experience of God's um, salvation, his presence, his help, you want to share it. You're passionate about sharing that joy story with others. You want others to find their way to the well. After the Samaritan woman's encounter with Jesus, she ran to tell people about living water. The shepherds ran to share the good news of Christ's birth. Isaiah says, let it be known to the world, he talks about. Shout aloud and sing for joy, people of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel among you. I call this sharing joy stories. There's so many. So another joy story I want to share is that the first nurse that attended to Randy when we're all frantic and worried and upset was a beautiful nurse named Ashley Driggers. Some of you might know her, okay? She is the daughter of Don and Libby Driggers, and she was one of the early leaders in upwards basketball when it started. And so here we are on this situation. We're just sharing a, a blessing and joy about how God's blessing us with upward sports. We're just sharing the story. And she was excited to hear that we were still doing this and that it was going strong. So here we are sharing testimonies in a time when it could have been really scary, and yet she brought us joy. I, the next day, I was able to go to the children's preschool program. Again, joy. As I saw these children praising God and singing and, and loving there are all kinds of God stories around. People serving, people helping. Um, I don't have time to name all the names, but I, I just am so blessed. I visited Edith Hillard and Shirley Pritchard. Both ladies met me. I met, walked in their room, and they had a smile for me. They were having hope and faith in the middle of going through hard times. And so, in a way, that was joy to be there with them. I'm also glad they're home now, too. And after this hard week, we also decided to go to a restaurant again. We tried to get on Friday. And so this time, instead of having a heart issue, um, we were blessed that right there was Ron Lindsay. Some of you know he's a, one of our Brook Hill um, friends here. And Ron said, I have something for you. He didn't even know I was going to be there. And he hands me a cross. And he had gone to get these little crosses that his wife, Jean, who's now in heaven, she used to give out to people, and she got them up in St. Mary's, and so he wanted me to have a cross, and I thought, wow, what a joy moment. Maybe you have a joy story you can share. I'd love for you to write it down, or share with me, or maybe we can fit it into a testimony time. I, I just feel like we need to hear these stories where God is present in the little things and in the big things. The focus of Advent is getting ready for Jesus' coming. And it reminds me of that passage in Luke that Ellen read and that the choir sang about. We want to be dressed for service and keep your lamps burning as though you're waiting for your master to return from a wedding feast. Can you imagine that? And so then, can you imagine opening the door and Christ being there? I love that imagery uh, to think about. And then the servants are ready 
and they will be rewarded because they're ready. Okay, I love that. And I also like the part about the master comes in and starts to serve the servants. Isn't that what Christ did for us? He came and gave his life for us on the cross. He showed his disciples about how to serve, that the Son of Man came to save and serve and serve others. And so that is what we are called to do. One of our biggest joys is when we serve and love and help other people. That joy is like a lamp burning inside of us. And others can see that. Um, Jill B. Cheston sent me a photo that I plan to use in a future bulletin. But it has, um, it's looking through one of our windows here and the candles burning with Christ above knocking on the door. See, Christ, we're preparing for him to come home to us on Christmas. But we also, we want to point others so they can come home to God. I love that. As a church, we are the light of Christ when we open the door to Jesus. I can't help but rejoice in this. It makes me want to celebrate, even when it's hard. I want to close with this poem by Anne Weems. She's one of my favorite Christian poets. And she, if anyone, would know what, it, what joy and sorrow are about. She lost her 21-year-old son um, on his birthday, right after his birthday, to a murder. And so she had great grief and pain. And yet this is what she writes. Not celebrate? Your burden too great to bear? Your loneliness is intensified during this Christmas season? Your tears have no end? Not celebrate? You should lead the celebration. You should run through the streets to ring the bells and sing the loudest. You should fling the tinsel on the tree. Open your house to your neighbors. Call them in to dance. For it is you above all others who know the joy of Advent. It is unto you a Savior is born this day, one who comes to lift your burden from your shoulders, one who comes to wipe the tears from your eyes. You are not alone, for he is born this day to you. That's real joy. I invite you today to come to the well of salvation. Drink from God's resources. God has, a, he'll give you a new perspective. He'll give you people to encourage you. He'll give you hope. He'll give you joy. Brookhill Church, let us invite others into the presence of God. In that place, joy will burst from the darkness of our souls. It will break the chains of fear and hopelessness. Help us to proclaim this joy in the face of all the negative news that we hear each day. We can look at the worst things that are happening around us and see the cross. We can see that through the suffering and death of Christ, God brought the joy of resurrection. We can hold that together. Trim your lamps. Keep your lights burning. Um, don't worry. Take a breath. Breathe. God's peace. For even if you don't see Jesus, you still love him. And even if you don't see Jesus, you still believe in him. And he will fill you up. I know. He'll fill you up with his joy, inexpressible joy. Amen. <laughs> Just to let you know, I videotaped that right after we got home from the hospital. So let's pray. On this Joy Sunday of Advent, let us proclaim the truth that we are not alone. In every hard and difficult moment, when we are discouraged and fearful, lead us to the well of your living water, of your salvation that is life to the full. Teach us to draw the water with real, inexpressible joy and proclaim to the world the glorious and good things you have done and are doing every moment. We thank you and praise you. Amen. Amen. Join me.